You're in the loop. We're here to discuss the ups, downs, and sideways of the sport of figure skating, and maybe give you plus five GOE along the way. This week's hosts are Evie, Nicola, and Neve. Yay, it's our first episode of like the proper season. We've got a competition to talk about, guys. It's gonna be crazy. Okay, so first we've got, we'll, let's do a, a quick host intro. So, hi, I'm Evie. And I'm the one that's still salty about the fact that the Chinese ice dance team, Wang Liu, never made the free dance at Pyeongchang. You can find me on Twitter at Double Flots. Hello, I'm Neve. I'm a university student in waiting who's spending her free time yelling about Jason Brown's Russian splits. You can find me on Twitter at Triple Axel with a capital I. Hi, I'm Nicola. I'm just an Australian trying to live my best skate on life. Uh, if I sound tired, it's because I got back from Bangkok just a few hours ago. Uh, I'm on Twitter at not nice at all. Uh, nice as in the type of rock. Okay, so moving on straight for, to the figure skating news of the last couple of weeks since our last episode. I think the major story that came out over the past couple of weeks was the fact that the Chinese pairs team, Sui and Han, withdrew from the Grand Prix series, which is a big, big deal. You know, Pears was already looking kind of empty first with uh, Seguin and Bilodeau breaking up as a team. And then the other Chinese Pears team, Yu Zhang, also sitting out of the Grand Prix. And so it's now with Sui and Han not being there, it's looking a little empty. I don't think it's like, well, in their case, it's obviously it's because due to injury, but I don't think it's also terribly uncommon for the post-Olympic Grand Prix series to look a little empty as well. So definitely, yeah. I'm hoping that, you know, they're able to recover from that shortly. But, you know, it's kind of, I I guess it's always I'm looking on the bright side and I'm just like, well, if there's, you know, lots of people singing it out anyway, it's not as if like any great value was missed in the competitive sphere. They'll be back and more prepared later in the season, which I think sometimes is overall better if you just have more time rather than starting the season super duper early with Grand Prix or even God forbid Challenger series. So If she's focusing on recovering from her injury, um, it means hopefully that they'll be back stronger than ever later on in the season when it truly counts with Worlds and Four Continents, etc. Well, definitely. And, you know, the last time they sat out of the Grand Prix series in 16 and 17, they ended up with the four continents and world's win. So, you know, maybe it'll be a good sign. It's maybe a good sign that they're choosing to sit out, especially since Wenjing's foot injury isn't completely healed. So we wish them all the best and hope that, you know, they get better or Wenjing gets better, you know, and we hope that they come back stronger in the second half of the season. So the second piece of news is that we have another uh, ju- another junior lady leaving uh, Ateri Tudbaretsi's camp in Russia, uh, Daria Panenkova. She uh, left Ateri about two weeks ago, and I think she- that makes her the fourth one to leave their coaching team. Yeah, I think it's very, uh, I think I've seen a lot of people sort of speculating it on Twitter, and I think it's very easy to sort of jump to the conclusion that this is some kind of like, you know, since Evgenia left, like a lot of other people are like, well, you know, screw it, I'll leave as well. Now's the time. But I mean, I think ultimately we'll never know a lot of the decision making that goes behind some of the students leaving a Terry. I mean, in Evgenia's case, it's maybe a little less uh, subtle, but uh, for some of the other skaters, I'd be very wary about making any assumptions as to why they are actually leaving her. Because I think it isn't, it isn't, dreadfully you know uncommon for skaters to leave that group anyway like they do have quite a high turnover historically so I think it's just now because if Genya's left like ever since then now everybody else who's leaving or transferring uh it's a big spotlight on that group uh ever since I've Genya left and so yeah I'm kind of like I'm all very very wary about some of the stuff I see the speculation I see surrounding a Terry's group because yeah, ultimately you do never know the reason and they are very secretive about it. And I know um, like Russian Twitter and Russian media in general have a, a whole host of reasons why they think these things are happening. But, you know, I'm quite happy, honestly, I'm quite happy not to know. And I hope it just works out for the best for the people who um, have decided to, to leave uh, the group. So I think ultimately, like, that's the type of environment that some people, they do really well in and some people simply don't. And it's clear through even some of this slightly, let's just say slightly biased, like, documentary and, like, Russian TV specials, the kind of environment that Ateri's uh, 
uh, group has when it comes to training so but yeah I am very wary just to like put another blanket on oh another person you know is having a bad time there it's time for them to leave it's like no well people have left there quite a bit in the past as well so yeah you know I could only hope that um Daria does well um with her uh new team so definitely I, I it's gonna be interesting to see her in the Grand Prix this season so Another piece of news is that Grant Hockstein, the American men's single skater, has retired from competition. This isn't really super surprising bit of news. You know, he's what? He's in his late 20s. You know, we kind of all expected this kind of announcement to happen. But, you know, we wish him all the best in whatever he chooses to do in the future. And there's been a lot of program announcements for the 2018-2019 season. So for all announcements, um, refer to our Twitter at InTheLowPodcast. One judge has them second. Should be carried off and uh, spanked. So this week's uh, main topic is, of course, about the first Challenger Series event, which is the Asian Open Figure Skating Trophy, which just wrapped up yesterday in Thailand. So, you know, it was it's the first proper competition of the season, which is kind of scary because, oh my god, off-season is finally over. I feel like it's just gone by in a flash and we're already in August and already finishing up the first competition. It's kind of scary. So the first competition was Asian Open, and this is actually the first ever year since the start of the Challenger Series, which was in the 2014-15 season, that an Asian competition has been included. Historically, all the other competitions in the Challenger Series have been in either Europe or uh, America or Canada. So it's really great to see that, you know, Asia and Asian figure skating is being recognized in this way by getting a challenger. So for people that don't know, challenger series uh, competitions are ranked below the Grand Prix and they often allow skaters who don't qualify for the more higher rank competitions to gain a lot more international experience. So especially with the later events like uh, the Alpen Trophy, Talon Trophy and Golden Spin, which all run during the Grand Prix. So it's really good for people who are either just coming up in the senior ranks or uh, have been in there for quite a while but come from smaller federations who don't get a lot of chances to go compete internationally to go to these events which don't have set technical minimums it's just it's really good for practice sake so other events earlier in the season such as autumn classic us classic lombardia finlandia and the andreas nebula um often attract top scooters because this is an opportunity for them to test out their competitive programs ahead of the grand prix series So I believe, yeah, we ourselves had some contention over what to call this event because the Asian Open has been taking place for for quite some years before. It has actually taken place in Bangkok before. However, it wasn't um, a a designated Challenger Series event. So this is the first year it's become part of the Challenger Series, but the event itself has been taking place for many years. So even like I was looking back and even like a few years, you know, before you know, back in the day, like Tatsuki, like Machida and all these people have, have all competed there. So it it's funny because I feel like I kind of, I haven't watched Asian Open the past couple of years, whether just because the entries weren't as like, you know, star studded or something like that. But it's really great to see, yeah, again, uh, Asian country uh, coming in with the Challenger Series, because as someone, you know, who's obviously from, uh, you know, the Asia Pacific, uh, it's really important to like have a competition, especially outside of Central and North Asia. So outside of China and Japan specifically, that's able to provide a platform for lots of smaller Federation skaters um, during this period of time, because Obviously, you know, it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of resources to get to those other Challenger series. So to have at least one in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, I think is like a fantastic initiative by, I don't know who put forward this decision. I want to say just the blanketly the ISU. So maybe occasionally they come up with good ideas like this. Who knows? So, the ISU having a good idea for once. Yeah. What is this wizardry? Apparently it's possible. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. So, I mean, thank you, ISU. So hopefully it, this does stick. They, they will keep um, a challenger series in Asia or at the very least Southeast Asia would be fantastic, I think, because putting something in Japan, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, wouldn't it be great if you had a challenger series in Japan? It's like, well... Japan already has a bunch of competitions. Do they really need it? Yeah, it kind of takes away takes away from the point of having one um, 
in this area, which is it's more accessible to, to smaller federation skaters. So if you put something in Japan, I think conversely, it becomes a little less accessible simply due to the, the nature of the, the entries and the competition in that area. So, but yeah, so very, very happy to um, have a Challenger Series competition taking place uh, in Southeast Asia. Mm. And of course, it's a, it was a it was a smaller event. It's the first Challenger ever to be held in Asia. You know, not everything there from an international fans' perspective wasn't running completely smoothly. I, we, we had a lot of issues with the live streams that they weren't flat out basically weren't working during uh, the novice and junior competitions, and they were intermittently working on Saturday. So mainly for the rhythm dance and the pairs and ladies short programs. Uh, Neve and I basically had a harder time watching it, but we still managed to get uh, fan cams. And so that's how we are able to discuss it properly here on the podcast. So, you know, we can, we can excuse them for ha- obviously for having streaming troubles because they're not as well equipped as some of the bigger federations or just bigger hosts in general. So, but it was just kind of disappointing just from a fan's perspective, to see that the streams weren't working. But yeah, hopefully if they host the uh, event again in the future that they won't have so many problems. But yeah. I think um, from from on a ground perspective, they're actually the actual running of the competition itself uh, and all the facilities for it that were there were great and everything was beautifully organized and there was nothing like from that kind of perspective and from a technical s- perspective, like on the ground, they're weren't any issues so the stream obviously that that is a it's a problem and it is quite difficult but I like to point out that like the stream when it did run would work quite well um even if like that it's something to do with their internet connection I think was a bit funny but because if you look at say other challenger series even things like for instance um Andre Deppler last year which the camera work was absolutely horrible and done from like the third story that was Um, awful (laughs) or if you're thinking about basically anything that's run in Bergamo uh, at ice lab so they also don't have really great high tech quality um streams either so i think actually from that perspective like their actual camera quality like of recording and stuff was actually it's actually quite quite good relatively speaking it was just the actual um making the stream accessible itself that became a problem so but from the ground level there was absolutely um i was actually quite pleased to see there was absolutely no technical uh difficulties well, overt technical di- difficulties from my perspective being in the audience. So I was, I was very, very happy with, with that. So, and obviously the facilities themselves are a lot, I think, smaller. Uh, if you're used to watching events that are held in Europe or in the US, as someone who's from Australia, it was absolutely unsurprising to me because our facilities in our country are, are almost identical um, to these ones. So I, I was quite comfortable. Um, I didn't have a problem with it. I know that there is some... Uh, issues around the temperature regulation in the venue. So the outside temperature outside the rink was about 33 degrees Celsius. So it's very, very warm out there. Nice and toasty. Nice and toasty. So the um, rink itself is in a mall, which is somewhat air conditioned. But the problem is when you have a lot of movement of people coming in and out of the rink, it's hard to control the temperature. So it was actually quite warm as a spectator. It was quite warm to sit in the rink, which is unusual because normally you're there and you're you're absolutely freezing. So um, that did have some effect on the ice quality. Uh, and a few different skaters did uh, bring that up, that it was quite inconsistent and there was a lot of sort of like uh, dripping onto the ice and stuff like that so you'd accumulate little holes and stuff like that so that's not unique to that venue that's something that happens basically if you're you're in this type of venue um if you're in like sort of asia pacific or anywhere where it's warmer and you don't have these massive arena facilities that's something that does happen so i think all things considered, uh, from a technical perspective, other than the stream, everything was actually quite great given the resources they had. So I'm hoping that um, the ISU will, like, I suppose, I don't know exactly how it works, but, you know, I hope they also saw that it was quite well done and they'll permit them to get, to keep doing it as a Challenger series. So Definitely. And going back to the stream, when it worked, the score page they had when the scores were being announced was excellent, the details... Um, they had the PCS and stuff come up. Yeah, that was really handy. So the first part of the competition that we're going to discuss in this episode was the men's competition. And I think I speak for a lot of fans in saying that the outcome of the event was very good. It made me personally very happy since we saw uh, the Japanese skater Soto Yamamoto winning 
for the first time at a senior ISU competition, which is really, really nice, especially uh, after his short program where he came in sixth. Uh, he managed to you know rise up back up in the free and claim first place, which is just, especially as someone who has followed Sota for a while, it's really nice to see him do so well in a competition like this. The quality of his skating skills, I think, really is the biggest standout for me, especially being there in person is just simply like he sort of just rises above sort of a lot of the other skaters in terms of basic skills. He's like incredibly quick on the ice. His edges are beautiful. He's very strong and he has a, a very good um, presence, I feel, on the ice. So that definitely comes across um, in real life as well as I'm sure in recording. So there is a few um, inconsistencies between um, some of the judges for GOEs, but I'm I am I am absolutely unsurprised at this. I feel like because this is the first Challenger Series event of the season and because we're entering a new season with a new scoring system, I, I'm not surprised that there are there are inconsistencies in that. And I don't I don't think those will be resolved by the end of the season. I think it will take probably a couple of seasons for these to sort of stabilize. So I think for for now, um, given the result was still quite favorable, like there was a few points where I was like, oh, I'm not sure if like I would agree with that, but honestly, the the overall and the average spread of GOEs I think was fine, given that it was the first Challenger Series comp and bigger comp that this has been applied to. So that's yeah. just my perspective on that. So I agree with you on that, especially with the new judging system and the plus and minus five grades of execution i think that with the fact that they're upping the scale to fives there's going to be a bit more inconsistency or just in the ranges that the judges are grading scores you could see that throughout this event and in events for the past couple like local competitions for the last couple weeks that some judges like the ranges of scores they were giving has widened a lot if you were comparing it to the previous system which you know is kind of to be expected as the judges kind of get settled into the the scoring system and I hope that as the competitions roll over and like you said Nicola in maybe a season or two once they properly start getting used to gotten have gotten used to it we'll see a bit more even spread of markings but especially with the with sort of scoring in the sh in the short program you know judge three in specifically was in components was giving him much lower marks than than I would have expected to see Everything except skating skills was uh, 4.5 or below. And I think skating skills only got to 5.25. And especially in comparison to what the other judges were giving him when they were all giving him sixes and sevens, to see those was just a bit like, uh, is judge three okay? Yeah, in composition, judge M1 gave him over three marks more than judge three. Oh, it's a little bit inconsistent. Yeah, I feel, I feel like it's very easy to sort of like... um. To look at sort of the protocols after the fact and go you know oh this this judge did a better job at scoring than this judge or this judge was more inconsistent and i think in some cases statistically um there is a significant difference but i think ultimately um there is a lot to do with like how they experience it um at the rink side and like their opinions on the skaters themselves i feel like you know especially consi considering the changes that have happened like i said i'm i'm not surprised at all that there is like a, a quite a large difference in in that scoring and ultimately i don't think it, it takes away from the performance or the overall score i feel like the overall score um is fair even for the short honestly i feel like that's um given that range across the judges i think it was a, a quite a fair score like i'm not here to here to, here to rank judges or the isu scoring system i have absolutely no no credentials on that but um just from that perspective i think um yeah i don't think there's any point in sort of like singling out a judge yeah i think across across the board i think the judges actually did a really quite fantastic job of uh, pulling everything together on the new system for this event because it could have been i just think of the way it could have been it could have been way way more spread out and more crazy than it was but everything was remarkably tight so um i was actually quite quite happy uh, all things considered. And so we'll see what, what happens when we get around to say Lombardia Trophy, which is famously uh, an event that has sort of uh, interesting scoring. But uh, for this particular for this particular event and talking at, uh, from it from the perspective of looking at Soda's protocols, um, I think everything was um, quite fair if, they, if, if varied, but that's only natural considering um, 
the nature of judging in figure skating. So yeah, and it was really nice to see in the free skate that sort of managed to uh, land his triple axel. For people that don't know, for maybe newer fans who don't really know Sota, he was uh, the tw- 2016 Youth Olympic champion. And he won a bronze medal in the 2015 Junior Worlds. And right before the 2016 Junior Worlds, he fractured one of his ankles, resulting in him having to withdraw from the competition. And he's had real issues over the past couple of years in regaining his jumps and getting them back. And it's only that since last season, when he went back to regionals and then nationals, and he, he got his triple lutz and triple flip back in around February. Uh, and now he's back with all of his jumps, including the triple axel at this competition, which is it's really good to see, especially since he's had such a long recovery process from that injury. Mm. So the question really is, will they give him that, Consider all things considered, seeing as he did take gold from this event, will they give him that magic spot at NHK Trophy? And I, I we will have to see after kinky regionals. Wink, wink. <laughs> that's, that's just my opinion. <laughs> well, yeah, and there's not that many other senior men that could foreseeably get that spot there's Ryuju Hino but uh apart from him and Sota there's yes there's Daisuke but there's, there's also the question of does Daisuke want to compete internationally which we're not entirely sure that if he hasn't said anything on the subject yeah. I think which... maybe did he mention in his blog that he didn't want to take opportunities away from some of the younger skaters because I think yeah. that's something that he did say so I mean I feel like you know, the, the J, JSF probably wants him to compete at NHK. <laughs> but, you know, we'll, we'll see if that ends up happening. What about Kaz, Kazuki Tomono? Uh, Dennis is at NHK and the, because of the seeding rules, Kazuki can't be there as well. Oh, I see. Okay. Because I was about to say, I was like, how dare you? How dare you? Forget <laughs> 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 about Kazuki. So uh, the skater that came in second, Chi Itzao from Taipei, he came first in the short and he came second in the free skate after a couple of issues on a few jumps in the free. But overall, I think a silver medal at a challenger event this early in the season is really good. It's a good motivator for the season ahead. Mm. An incredibly an incredibly strong skater, like incredibly powerful skating. Again, very, very good skating skills, um, which isn't something that I guess you're sort of used to when you're looking at smaller federation skaters. Um, he's from Chinese Taipei. So, um, and also great with um, fans, really good at working up the crowd. So everybody was very, very hype, um, which was We which could, was we could a lot hear the fun. blood-curdling fangirl screams from yeah, the stream. So that was, I believe a lot of those, those small, like, screams came from, um, there's the, um, the uh, novice uh, Thai skater group uh, so they do they did love to have a good scream so um, that's always encouraging yeah so but yeah I was I was incredibly I was blown away um by the the strength in his skating and a real really good presence like quite quite like Sota but maybe a different brand so but yeah it was I was very pleasing to see so because I wasn't really expecting um a skater from Chinese Taipei to walk away with a with a podium place so it was I quite I was very happy with the decision, and again I thought the scoring for him was very fair because sometimes um, when you're at events like this and you do have a lot of skaters from smaller federations, you do see a lot of that sort of uh, questionable PCS sort of stuff happening because you have smaller fed skaters, they have less of a reputation, the judges are typically not inclined to give them as many marks for whatever reason. Um, for that, but I was I was very happy with the PCS scores that he was getting. I think they were reflective of. Um, at least from my perspective, um, the quality of skating that he was giving. So I was very, very pleased to, to see that. Definitely. And hopefully we'll see him later in the season, pro- possibly at Four Continents. So in third place for this event was Sejong Byun from Korea. He was second in the short and third in the free. And this was actually my first time seeing him skate at a competition. Or, and I was... I was decently impressed. I think that he's got a lot of talent, but I think that both of his programs, considering it's so early in the season, were kind of empty in in terms of performance standards, which is fine for this. Uh, for, it's fine for August, you know. It's things are only going to get better from here. I don't have too much to say about him, to be honest. I think it's sort of much in the same boat. So um, it is very early in the season. Um, so I'll look, this is sort of almost the. The, the a testing ground um, for for new programs. So I felt that sort of definitely was the case in, in his instance as well. I, I I'm not 
like tuned in to um the korean federation uh or korean skaters in general to be quite honest um but uh he was incredibly popular <laughs> amidst the amidst the crowd so there was a lot of fans there i think a lot of fans as i mentioned from uh korea there and so i'm not sure if he's considered to be sort of like um an up-and-coming uh skater whether he has uh considered to have a strong future so i think his coach is actually quite famous i'm not I'm not entirely sure. Someone someone was telling me this at the time. So uh, I'm hoping, yeah, for a lot of growth over the season would be very nice to see from him. So. Definitely. You can't really complain at an early season competition to get three personal best scores. You know, that's a really good showing. So in fourth place of the event was Mitsuki Sumoto, a Japanese figure skater who's actually competing mainly on, who, on the junior circuit. He was uh, ninth at Junior Worlds this year. And, you know, fourth place at a senior event when you're mainly competing on the junior level is really impressive. I find that, you know, Mitski has definitely been one skater to watch over the last junior season. So I'm very excited to see how this showing and how this fourth place, you know, finishing will affect his movement going into the season proper. I didn't find that he projected very strongly and with a prog- with programs like Tosca and stuff like that I felt like that was sort of maybe something more important but again it was very early in the season there's a lot of development for that kind of stuff like that I'm very happy to see his programs this season I feel like they suit him more than the programs from last season did again one of those situations where you're like it's very early in the season be very good to see him grow but yeah I think something for him to work on definitely would be some of that projection because um just trying to have more like expressiveness physically so um so some of those finer details that some a skater for instance like sota has a lot of experience in and he's able to project that very like easily with a with a lot of fluidity whereas mitski as he's quite young you know obviously you know sort of still competing around uh junior level um that's something that will take him more time to develop but i think he has a incredible potential so a little bit of a, a shout out right at the end for this is uh Kwang Bon Ham from the People's Republic of Korea, aka North Korea. He this is the first time that we've seen him at a competition because you know there's not that many skaters coming out of North Korea, and I think the majority of us were pretty damn shocked at just how big his jumps were. I certainly was not expecting it, especially in the short, like the first what the first triple axel that he did. It was just like, oh, okay, this is what we're in for. It was freaking huge, and yeah, I'm I'm excited to see if we'll see him later in the season probably not at four continents since he didn't get the technical minimum in the free program at this event but who knows he might enter another challenger series later and possibly score enough to get him in yeah it was just a big impact (laughs) we were so like there was so much height he just didn't have a lot of control they weren't consistent but they were so high spring loaded i found that uh like during his program as well he didn't lose a lot of energy which i was very surprised at because normally what you if you see large jumps like that you'll see a skater like tire quite quickly into the end of the program but he actually maintained the height in his jumps like lacking consistency in his landings but was still able to maintain the height of his jumps through the whole program without superficially looking very tired or looking exhausted which is something um even a regular skater who doesn't jump multiple feet in the air has that kind of problem so uh yeah it was it was quite amazing definitely and it's also just really it's very strange especially coming off the back of an olympic season to see a men's event where there have been barely any quads attempted i I mean i know that it is a lower rank about uh, it's a smaller competition with somewhat lower rank skaters but at the same time the whiplash i'm just like okay barely any quads and none landed successfully all right it's it's refreshing and i quite like you know i like was going to jokingly tweet out that it's a triple only event and and quads are banned but um (laughs) but it's it's nice sometimes when you when you you have that i guess more consistency in landing jumps which i think is something because triples are considered um well aren't as difficult as quads you have that sort of element where you can expect people generally to land things a little more consistently so it's sort of nice to see an event where you sort of you don't have that that over overhead pressure overhead quad pressure I guess is what you would call it so um yeah I was quite quite pleased to see that I think if anything this event was the um the triple axle pressure 
Um, so, cause we didn't see very many of those either. Um, and I want to, I guess, um, my, one of my shout outs would be to the Australian, one of the Australian skaters, James Min. Um, he is very, very young and he just came up from juniors, um, last season. So he was doing both junior and senior events last season. He's had a very, uh, inconsistently performing triple axel. He landed multiple of them during you know, practices and during warm-ups and stuff like this, but wasn't able to nail any during his programs. But I think uh, there's something to say about it's, we have to remember that I think a lot of the time we're thinking about quads and all these high rank skaters landing, landing quads, but simply like a triple axel is an incredibly difficult feat to perform. So I, it's really nice to, to watch an event like this and really sort of put that into perspective. So yeah, so that's just like I'd like to give a shout out to him because I think he did he, he did a great job and he, he is quite young. So next we're going to talk about the ladies and I think we were all very happy when Unsu Lim from Korea won um, overall. She won the short and was second in the free. So she's recently made a transition to Raphael Artunian. Um, so I think we were all a bit excited slash nervous, I guess, and see how that's going to pan out. But her short was very, very clean. Her free, um, not so much. <laughs> she definitely had some prob- some jumping problems in the free, yeah. I think her short program was a bit somber. I think she's more suited to the upbeat fun programs like her free skate or Chicago. Like the music cut's a bit odd. I don't know if it's just I'm not used to it or so I wonder how that's going to pan out later in the season as she matures into it. Yeah, I think that with Onsu and especially with her coaching change, when the news came out that she was switching to RAF, I personally was a bit worried, mainly because that I think Onsu is known as a, as being a pretty sturdy jumper, especially when she was last year in juniors, she was quite consistent. And I was thinking you know, why is she going, switching to a coach that's pretty jump focused rather than going to someone who's more well known for improving the basics and the skating skills, which is what she kind of needs to really get the notch up on the others. But, you know, I'm still, I'm very happy with her showings here, as especially in the short, like I wasn't completely enthused by the music. It's pretty, as Neve said, it's pretty somber. It's kind of one tone throughout the whole program. It doesn't really build but you know that might change and her expression might change in as we go further down the season but overall I think she should be really happy with a, a win here especially since she's a first year senior yeah it's pretty it's pretty great especially a, a personal best in the short as well mm, yeah I was quite you know she's like you said she's a very sturdy jumper and I was not there actually for the free program but I was there for short program and all of her practices and she was quite consistent but there was in her free practice she was also um having trouble with jumps as well so um i was surprised to hear that she she didn't manage to land many of those when in the actual uh free skate events but yeah i was sort of i guess maybe i was more surprised the difference between a short program and a free program even between the the practices um so i'm not sure you know it's one of those situations where you're like well what happened did you get a bad night's sleep or you know what what's going on there because it went from being like you know incredibly consistent to sort of like ah. so you never you never know like that's the thing and i think about that i know this is a bit navel gazing a little bit esoteric but I think about this a lot when it's like when somebody like they'll have a good short program and like their free program isn't as as good you think you know did you get food poisoning like (laughs) you know did you sleep okay was there like you know was there a fire alarm in your apartment building or your hotel like you you don't know so it was one of those situations where I was actually really quite a little bit surprised that there was um quite a bit of difference between those two because as I said yeah her short was very very tight it was very tight for, for for so early in the season incredibly tight short program definitely but yeah no so I I actually quite like I know people have been drawing parallels between uh her free program and Mariah Bell's I believe short program from last season the Roxy short program um but I think honestly uh, uh, honestly like she does suit those fun programs and she did a similar program last season as well I think that they do suit her quite well so but that being said I think um, that Samba program is also good for her as well. So I actually quite like having sort of that match pair of short program and free program where she has that sort of range that she's able to show. So if it were, if it were me, I'd probably swap them around and have the, um, sort of more serious program to be her, her free 
to, to give her to more opportunity because we already know that she can do this this fun and upbeat stuff. So I guess that's what I was surprised at is that um, the free program is the one where um, they chose to, I guess, show off her strengths um, and give her that um, Chicago free program. So it's unfortunate that she wasn't able to skate that to the best you know of that she could at the time but i have no doubt that she will later in the season unless there's some sort of um uh issue with uh adjusting to the new coaching regime which is entirely possible because it is a big it's a big no pun intended a big jump <laughs> uh, to, 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 to go to raf's camp so i think for for a lot of the ladies as well so Well, we'll see her on the GP and hopefully she'll have a good showing at the one event she's assigned to there. So in second place was um, Yuna Shiraiwa from Japan. She was fourth in the short and first in the free. Um, Her short wasn't clean. However, I am kind of obsessed with it. It's (laughs) (laughs) unconventional. I I loved it. It was great. I love kind of unconventional music choices and this sort of electro swing kind of fun short program I think really suits her. Yeah, it was a shame about the the technical issues in the short, but she kind of managed to bounce back in the free, even though she had uh, a couple issues with under rotations. And, you know, being in such a packed senior ladies field in Japan, I think Yoon is quite underrated as a skater. But especially since we didn't really see her that that much last season. Last season was her first senior season. She got two Grand Prix and then we saw her at Nationals. And obviously she didn't qualify for the Olympics or Four Continents or Worlds. So it's fun to see her at this event, and I really hope that she has a good season this time and possibly gets more opportunities to go to bigger competitions and show off her skills because I think she's definitely one to watch. I think it's one of those cases where I was the thing I was most struck by by Yuna um, was how similar some of the mannerisms and even down to stuff like her jump technique is um similar to Satoko Miyahara uh simply based because they have um the same Kochamara and it really makes me wonder um it really well it makes you wonder in general how much influence the coach does have on the style of skating because even down to the very small like um accents and gestures of um in some of her programs particularly in her free program they are they the first thing i thought when i saw them was like oh satoko uh, but <laughs> but obviously that's that must be a remnant of uh coach hamada more not satoko you know what i mean just because they, they share a coach and similarly yeah her, her judge uh, her jump technique um is a little reminiscent of that as well like edge calls and not very um high jumps which like it, it does make me wonder a little bit about like how much influence the coach does have on that but like you were saying um i really did like her um her short program was was very was very enjoyable and she was able to sell that quite well so which was a little more out of the box and didn't make me think about um that kind of brand of skating that i guess hamada has sort of brought in the in the ladies field in japan so yeah, I, I quite enjoyed it. But yeah, it was like, yeah, it was really interesting to see her skate um, in real life because I was, I didn't know that her mother was her coach until I saw, actually physically saw her mother there. I was like, oh, oh, it all makes sense now. <laughs> it, is, it is remarkably similar. So, so yeah, so, yeah. So in third place was Mako Yamashita from Japan also. Um, she had a few jump issues, mainly in the loots. You know, Mako's a, She's a first-year senior. She won bronze at Junior Worlds last season. Really good showing there. You know, she scored personal best there at that competition. Coming here, you know, there was a lot kind of, a lot of expectations riding on her, I feel. It, uh, there was a lot of fans who were interested into how she would do. And, you know, with the, the pro- problems in the short, she missed the combo in the short. And then in the free, she only had one combo so her jumping technique itself, I feel, has gotten slightly, I wouldn't necessarily say worse, but just it's changed since the, in the time the off-season started. The LUTs especially, it's the consistency on it is down. The landings of either that we saw at the competition had either been really tight or she's fallen, whereas that jump was pretty strong for her last season. So you kind of have to wonder, you know, is this a, you know, pro- are these problems that she's getting from these jumps um, her coach is changing her jumping technique or if it's a puberty issue which you know happens a lot in lady skating it's just kind of worrying but you know as we said it's early season it's early days you know some her consistency might 
go up as the season continues. So I guess we're just going to have to wait and see, really. And her flip was downgraded in the um, short program as well, I think. I think her short program is very... Uh, you know, one of our coaches is obviously Miyoko Higuchi, Shoma's coach, who's kind of very well known for out of the box music choices. And I think that her short program is kind of like reminiscent of that in that it's a song that I didn't know it was Una Voce Poco Fa. I, I, I personally had never heard of it before. And when I was watching it, I was like, ah, yes, Miyoko's music collection is definitely present in this program. It's good. I'm, I'm excited to see how Mako's going to do on the Grand Prix with the move up to senior. So Star Andres was in fifth from the um, from the USA and the last time I had seen Star really was US Nationals and her free skate there was outstanding. I think everyone who was watching it will agree. No one really, like from US Nationals, everyone, it was a shock to a lot of people. Um, so her short program here was, I think, thought kind of reminiscent of that like I didn't expect her to come second in the short and she did it was a bit dull I think in my opinion at least but oh, it suits her and I think it could be good in the future it's just early season and it will develop obviously as time goes in the season I wasn't expecting her for go to go for the triple axel in the free program I was completely shocked when she attempted it I mean she it was unsuccessful and it was downgraded but it was definitely interesting to see I personally think the both programs, as we keep saying, you know, early seasons, programs are looking a little bit dull. The uh, the free skate, I think, is definitely one that's going to improve over the course of the season. Like, by nationals, hopefully, it should be very well developed. At the moment, it's just kind of, yeah, sort of, kind of unmemorable, in, in, in my opinion. The music choice, though, for a free skate, I don't know what the title of the program is actually called, because I, try, I tried to Shazam the music, and there's about four different pieces of... African drum music in it. I don't know exactly know what the title of her program is called because again, ISU Bio hasn't been updated. So, but I'm all for unconventional music choices. I'm definitely looking out for how this program is going to develop over the the next couple of competitions she's at. Mm -hmm. I'm just glad there's another face in US ladies, especially with Mariah and Ashley sitting the Grand Prix. I, I don't. We don't really know if they'll return later in the season, but US Ladies was beginning to get a bit sparse. So I think especially, I think with Brady coming up and Star, it'll start to get a bit more interesting as there's more people that will actually be able to compete for spots and stuff. Yeah, I was quite pleased. I didn't see US Nationals. I didn't watch them, but I did see Star at uh, Four Continents uh, at the end of last season. And I was actually quite pleased to see that some of her... Um, I guess upper upper body movement ish, issue. I don't want to say issues, but she was quite stiff at four continents, and it was quite noticeable, particularly her arm movements. Um, I think over the off season, she has worked on those a lot. I think that maybe had been a priority for her. Um, she still has a bit of that stiffness. It's almost like a junior skater stiffness. You know what I mean? So she's starting to lose that, which is good because it was. Um, I felt like it it put a dampener on her programs a, a little. Um, I don't can't say for US Nationals whether that was a bit better, but at least in this instance, I'm glad to see that there's been some progression in that. Yeah, I was also surprised to hear about the triple axel attempt. So that was not something I was expecting from her. Um, I don't know if it was like a YOLO moment or something like that. Um, you know, I have no doubt that if she trains it, she she could be one of the you know many ladies who are now coming coming up with uh potential triple axles um i i loved her free skate music i was surprised at her short program music i thought given after last season where i believe she had beyonce uh that she she would have something that that wasn't as i guess uh strong <laughs> i say like strong pop music and said it was a little bit more subtle which is totally fine um but i also think that that strong like honestly Beyonce really suits her and you can tell she really enjoyed skating to it whereas in this instance um so sort of the more the more subtle I guess you know instrumental music is is also good um but you can tell that maybe for her she it's harder for her to like project herself into it but again this is something that can be improved through the season and again because she is I, I when you watch her skate she is a very much a junior skater still um I think that's something you know that time will time will help with so but yeah do love love the free skate music choice i thought it was was wonderful um so i hope that develops further into the season
So the next discipline we're going to be talking about is pairs, and obviously there was there's not a lot to say because there were only two competing pairs at this event. Now that means obviously that when there are so little uh, skaters competing at a challenger event in one discipline, I, there are requirements for the amount of skaters from a certain amount of federations to be present at an event to, in order to get world standing points, and that obviously wasn't reached considering the fact there were only two skaters. Uh, so the Results at this event for pairs aren't counted in the world standings, unfortunately. But that's okay because, you know, automatic medals! Yay! So, uh, the Chinese pairs team of Peng Jin won uh, with a pretty big lead over Ryom Kim from North Korea. Peng Jin are going to be the top Chinese pair on the Grand Prix circuit this season now that both Sui and Han and Yu and Zhang are out. So it's definitely, you know, a first place win at a challenger event early in the season should be good motivation to really move them up to the top. I feel like, you know, especially after they, they didn't reach the free skate at the Olympics and they bounced back at Worlds and finished ninth. And hopefully the momentum going on from that is really going to help them. I'm not the biggest fan of them. I find that their programs are very fun. I like their short program from uh, last season, the Assassin's Tango one. But I find that a lot of their lifts, uh, some of the positions of the lifts can be kind of not too aesthetically pleasing, just with the leg position, overall body movements. So just, no, they're not as good in comparison to some of the other pairs. But that being said, they're a Chinese pair. They're still very stable in all of their elements. Their throws are really big. They cover a lot of space. And their twists and their solo jumps are usually reasonably consistent too so you know it's definitely good that they they won here and hopefully they'll have a good grand prix series i wasn't completely enthused by their free skate music choice just because i think lovey on rose is a piece of music that's kind of war horsey and used quite often so i don't know maybe the program will grow on me as the season goes but yeah i think they suffer a bit as not being the top pairs in their fed like Chinese pairs is very stacked. Like, Chinese pairs is famous for being... A powerhouse. Yeah, so I think they kind of suffer a bit from being behind, like, Swing and Han. A lot, they're kind of overlooked a bit, so I think it'll be interesting to see them on the Grand Prix circuit without having them, to see how they go as being the top Chinese pair. Okay, and in silver, obviously out of the two pairs, one has to come in second, uh, is Ryom Kim from North Korea. And I think... Ryom Kim are definitely, they're one of my personal favourite pairs, and the fact that we don't get to see them that often in comparison to a lot of others, you know, last season was definitely a breakout for them, the fact that they won a Four Continents medal, and they had a really, really strong showing at the Olympics, and now that they, they're going to the Grand Prix for the first time, it's the, um, they've got two assignments, and that's really exciting. They had some issues with levels in the short program and in the free, and that's kind of a common thing that they're in their skating, especially uh, uh, with their step sequences. But I think that their triple twist in the short only got a basic level, which means that, you know, it didn't hit any of the other level criteria, which, you know, isn't the best, but they still scored really well, and they're, they're keeping both of their programs from last season into this season, which, you know... Usually I wouldn't be completely crazy about, but the fact that we see them so little means that I haven't gotten tired of the programs. Plus their short program is just fantastic. It's incredibly strong. A day in the life, yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, incredibly strong. And they, they play it so well. And when I saw them at Four Continents, it was it was a it was a phenomenon. It was amazing. So it was kind of funny to see them here and it was a bit more subdued, but still the same program. So it's like, it's a, you know, it's a little jarring. But yeah, I think they can definitely work on those two programs again. You know, I think it's absolutely no issue for them. So I'm hoping that they can peak this year even higher than they did last year because they did quite well last year, all things considered. So next we go on to ice dance. And with this comes the new change to rhythm dance instead of short dance, which is... I think a thing that's going to take everyone a bit of a while to get used to. Yeah, just a, just a blanket apology that if, in case we accidentally say short dance, we're sorry. Also with the tango romantica pattern, I it's a bit 
weird, especially when there's sibling teams on the circuit. Like the persons here are a siblings team. It's a bit awkward trying to watch and do a Tango Romantica. Especially with Tango Romantica coming off Olympic season with the rumba pattern. I think from a fan's perspective, rumba was, you know, you had a lot of samey programs with rumba, I feel, and a lot of similar music choices. But overall, the pattern dance was on average pretty easy to understand considering, you know, there was only one hold, there was only three key points to look out for. So from an Ice Dance fan perspective, rumba, you know, was fine. And then you have Tango Romantica coming in, which is just like, you want some more, so you want some more things to look out for? Have two sections and eight key points in total, to which I'm just like, and like multiple changes of hold. So, you know, I think for it's going to take a while for a lot of Ice Dance fans to, you know, get into Tango Romantica properly. But just the tech panel and the short dance was on fire with the calling. I mean, only one Tango Romantica pattern ended up getting a level three, which was um, the, the first section of the Parsons short dance, and everyone else was level two and below. So, you know, that's this could it's an early season thing, you know, it might take a few more months of practice before the teams really settle into the pattern and we start seeing the higher levels. But yeah, it's just a question a questionable choice in theme especially when you have siblings teams. I'm going to be the devil's advocate here and say that I love Tango Romantica and I disdained Rumba. (laughs) (laughs) So for me, I was absolutely, I was just like, yes, yes. So happy uh, for, for the, for that uh, being the, the uh, rhythm dance, God forbid, the rhythm dance choice. So I was actually quite happy about it. And I, I, I think it is, it can be, it is valid saying that it can be more difficult for the um, the sibling teams for uh, Tango Romantica to be able to portray that. Um, but that being said, I think the Parsons did remarkably well and I didn't have any sense of, like, I, I feel like, I feel like it's more, sometimes it can be more... Um, the fans projecting onto the skaters that it's a problem than the skaters themselves like like the shibitanis for instance and the same with the parsons like for them i don't feel like they have an issue with it at all and if if they do they do a remarkable job of covering it up um during their skating um so and i think a big part of it is because for sibling ice dancers um the nature of their relationship is generally they've been skating for a very, very long time. So they're used to portraying this type of, you know, this type of skating, which I think isn't a problem for them. So for me, like, again, maybe I'm just being a devil's advocate, but I don't see a problem in in that kind of thing. I, I appreciate you taking an opposite stance, but you also have to think about the fact that, like, in the Tango Romantica guidelines, like, the literal first sentence in the description of Tango Romantica is the fact that it is a romantic and sensual dance and you kind of have to think that over the course of the season how are the judges going to respond to skaters that can't necessarily fit that criteria well not criteria but fit that kind of mold and how if possibly they might in bigger competitions with bigger fields how sibling teams could be affected by that. That I mean, it is it is possible, but again, like for my for me, I feel like that's like it's a it's proje- it's maybe projecting a bit. Like I feel like the the skaters themselves and especially the judges are used. They're absolutely used to this because I mean, sibling ice dances and like for to a lesser extent, pairs aren't are very very common. And ro- romanticism in ice dance is not new at all. So this is something that a lot of them have been dealing with for a long, 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 long time. And as much as it is, I guess, maybe superficially, you, you could say, oh, maybe it is a struggle to to say skate centrally um, with someone if, you know, they're your brother or sister. I feel like at, at the end of the day, it comes across in skating and the motions of their skating. It's not real. So I feel like, yeah, again, it's it, and it's something, you know, for a casual audience, I feel like it's very, very difficult for them more so to get over that kind of fact. But for the skaters and for the judges, which are the number ones and the number twos of um, of actually performing these, these type of programs, I think it's uh, basically a non-issue for, for them. And because, like I said, like sibling 
Ice dancers generally have been skating together for a bajillion years. I'm sure they're very used to having to skate programs that have them in the position where um, they're meant to be lovers, you know. I, I like, but yeah, yeah. That's just that's just my opinion, but that's sort of like a different standpoint for that. So, um, yeah, I was uh, I was very happy. The Parsons, like I said, they did an amazing job with Tango Romantica. I thought, and they're sort of from a superficial point of view, as someone who doesn't know too much about um, any of the like required patterns and stuff. Um, it was very, from my perspective, this competition was very much like looking at sort of the Parsons who have like been grown up together as ice dancers and then looking at the other ice da dancers who have like sort of come together later in their careers because there's definitely like that experience level shines through like so so much so it's it's quite remarkable to to, to see that so um yeah that was my biggest thing was really like looking at the the way the parson skated was entirely different from the other uh, ice dancers, which uh, could be as a result of their of their you know coaching teams or um, where they're from, but I think as a lot of result is uh, that is a result of the just their level of experience they have skating together, which some of the um, other ice dancers don't have. So, but that being said, they came in second. So I think ultimately, yeah, Wang Lu did an absolute amazing job so i'm very very happy for them to come in first so oh god yeah Wang Lu just they are personally one of my top favorite ice dance teams i've been following them for the like since i got into figure skating and just they're obviously you know being a fan of a mid-tier ice dance team is tough but you know um the fact that they came in first and did such a fantastic job in both segments i mean obviously I think a lot of us were kind of confused with their choice in the music for the rhythm dance with Pirates of the Caribbean. Hey, but, I know, loved it. It had sword fighting. It. It, That's it what the people want. Give the people what they want. They want sword fighting. Exactly. Keep it interesting. <laughs> it was just, especially after the like the off season that that they had with, there were rumors that the Chinese Skating Association were potentially going to mix up their dance teams like they did with their pairs a couple oh, years back when they switched. You can't switched. do that. <laughs> Chinese fed, what are you doing? <laughs> Please. And instead of, instead, of, when I heard that news, I was like, they can't switch Wang Liu up. They're so, they're just, they're such a good team together. And instead of switching up, they sent them, they sent them off to Montreal to Gadbois. So, you know, I'm perfectly fine with that, you know, get that edge. And now they're coming back here for their first competition and just their free dance was just fire. I absolutely loved it. And I'm so glad that they kept in their straight line lift from last season, the one where he picks her up by the foot over his shoulder. Cause that is one of probably, that is probably my favorite lift in ice dance period. So I'm very glad that they kept that in. And I'm just, I'm going to speak it into existence that this program will at some point over the season score over a hundred points for them. I'm gonna I'm just I'm speaking it out. I need I need this. Please universe. Yeah, no, I agree. The um free dance was amazing. The music was incredible. The costumes were simple, but they were effective. Like you didn't notice they were simple, if that makes sense. I I think that they're probably they're probably just placeholder costumes and they're probably gonna get new ones before the season, but it still worked for the music. Yeah, even then a lot of like placeholder costumes and stuff you can point out and you can tell which is gonna be but this one, it, like, it felt natural, if that makes sense. But I also feel like their overall, like, skating ability over the last couple seasons has improved, especially with their twizzles. Uh, a cup like, looking back kind of in the 15-16 season where they weren't as strong a team, they weren't, like, they didn't qualify for the free dance at 2016 Worlds, and they kind of had a bit of inconsistency with that. Looking at them now, after their off-season in Montreal everything's looking a little bit more confident and especially their twizzles are looking a lot more solid. So I'm really excited to see exactly what's going to happen with them over the season. Although that, that's old news. Everyone knows that I'm a massive Wang Liu fan. So the Parsons were in second. Their um, free skate wasn't as good as their short, should we say. They were in third in the free. To build a home is very war horsey. A lot of people have done it. A lot of people have done it well. Habadakis and Cizeron done it not too long ago. Yeah, I kind, I kind of question the choice in the music for the free dance, especially since we had Papadakis and Cizeron do it in 
the 15-16 season and scored a world record. You're trying to you think about, you know, especially in, the, uh, in your second senior season and wanting to really build up your strengths and get noticed, choosing a program and a piece of music that's very well known from another team is kind of questionable to me. I always think I always I think the same thing, but I think in a lot of these cases they use it as like a, a homage. Like so, the judges go, "Oh, you guys have been watching the classics. Good for you." Like that's always like <laughs> the my. Classics I am. I am. Three years I have ago. Absolutely no. I uh, no idea if that is the case, but like that's always the question with war horses. Is just like you know, it's difficult to understand why people pick to do war horses because they are so you know you. I feel like in a location you're never going to be able to perform it as well as say the classic performance of that war horse that's associated with a certain set of skaters. But I think in that instance, it's definitely like it plays into the A, it's a good piece of music and B, it, it is almost a homage in a way. So I agree that, it, you know, I feel like they could be stronger with different music, but I mean, their skating is quite strong. So maybe they'll grow into it a little more as the season progresses. I'm not sure. Uh, so Masato Komatsubara and uh, Tim Coletto did some absolutely wonderful programs, especially their, I thought their rhythm dance was just an absolute banger and they really do sell it. And like, as it has been over the past few seasons, they've shown amazing growth and their recent, we've discussed this uh, previously in the thing, but their, their recent um, change uh, moving to Montreal to work with Gabois, I think has been a fantastic choice for them. And it's sort of almost remarkable, like, um, how much they've grown just over the off season. So it is very, very exciting um, to see them come into the season. And of course, they'll be at NHK, which I think will be a fantastic opportunity for for them. So I'm very happy that they, they came in with a bronze at, at this event. And of course, yeah, it's the rhythm dance uh, beat their personal best. So I think they were very, very happy with that. And they also seem very, very happy with their with their free dance as well. So I've only only good things to say about them. And the costumes were delightful. They themselves are quite delightful. I'm obviously very biased, but but I think they I think they honestly do have a, a very they have a big future in in ice dance uh, for Japan. I think they they can only really sort of um they have a very strong upward trajectory. I guess definitely. Yeah, I feel like especially with people sitting out of this season in ice dance or just the field being slightly less intense than it was last year. I think there's definitely opportunity for teams to kind of rise up to the top, especially with I'm thinking of like um, Kanemaru Morimoto and Chris Reed at Worlds next year. They're definitely in a position where they could quite easily get two spots for Japan in the next Worlds. And then, you know, Coco Team Coco could go to Worlds in the following year. And it's just really exciting to see Asian Federation ice dance kind of rise up. And, you know, coming off the back of a big coaching change to get three personal best scores at this event is really fantastic. And both of their programs are really, really strong. I think their free dance is very soft and pretty, but also, you know, very strong choreography wise. And uh, I, their twizzles are looking fantastic. The, the lifts in it, in their free dance, were stunning, especially the rotational lift. They did get a deduction in their free dance for uh, one of their lifts was hold, held for too long, which is, you know, kind of not uncommon deduction seen throughout ice dance, especially early in the season when people are getting used to their music. So, you know, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen to Team Coco throughout this season. Hopefully we'll see them on the GP and then hopefully... We'll see them at four continents. So very exciting. I know you love their rotational lift, but personally for me, the ending lift into the ending position was breathtaking. Yes. Like I had to pause and go and rewatch it again <laughs> <laughs> just to kind of wrap my head around it. It's very, yeah, I, I agree. That That is also my favorite. And they do, they, they sell it as well. Yeah, so Chantal, uh, Kerry and Andrew Dodds, uh, also uh, Ice Dancers representing Australia. Um, Australia has not a particularly a varied history of ice dance, so um, I am not sure how long it's been uh, since Australia has gotten a spot at Worlds for ice dance, but basically... Quite a long time, um, probably. Yeah, quite a, lo quite a long time, if ever. I'm pretty sure they have in the past, but it just hasn't been for a significant amount of time. So they're... they're I think they, they've started working together a 
couple of seasons ago. So um, sort of the catch being that um, Chantal Carey was obviously she was a single skater. Uh, before this, her brother is Brendan Carey, um, who's the current national champion for Australia, six years in a row. Um, Andrew Dodds, um, again, comes from a strong figure skating family and he's still competing in singles. So he's doing both at the same time, which is, you know, <laughs> it's just crazy. So, um, so, so yeah, so them coming together, I think it was, like for me personally, like uh, it depends from sort of uh, ice dancers to ice dancers. Sometimes when you take skaters who are who do have that strong singles background, you put them together. Sometimes it's quite obvious that they're both strong single skaters that have been put together. But for them, I feel like they have very they have quite strong skating skills that sort of support their single skating background. But they have very 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 good chemistry and very good projection, and I think. Of course, because they are relatively new at ice dance together, a lot of their uh, fundamentals like n- do need to be like grown, and I think that will cut. Co- that will definitely come from experience. So again, I think they've again developed a lot even from last year. Um, seeing them at this competition because I saw them quite a few times last year. Um, uh, but I think they have a, a definitely have a lot of potential because both of them have strengths and expression and they can definitely sell they can definitely sell their performances very very effectively so it's just waiting for them to build up those um those like ice dance fundamentals and to 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 hit to hit all those points and be able to um so upgrade some of their elements i think is is really is really what they're needing but that will come through experience i feel so i think as they had mentioned one of their aims was to 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 get to free dance at worlds um and potentially like even coming way way into the future try and get a spot for ice dance for australia uh at beijing and i think um if they continue to grow and they continue to work on that i think that is that is possible for them but yeah it's just a matter of accumulating um that experience because obviously it's something you know i feel like ice dance is like you know a fine wine so (laughs) you really do see it like i mentioned before with skaters who who have skated together for a long time they do have a different feel than um skaters that have come together recently so i i see i'm hoping that um using like playing these programs to their strengths um they're able to um develop through the season and sort of come out in a strong spot uh for australian ice dance which again historically you know is it is, has a varied history so it would be very good if that if that could happen so yeah and just speaking of their programs in the rhythm dance their sweet dreams program i love uh, it. it did it <laughs> did get a, a minus two deduction on the music requirement being that uh I don't, it's not actually explicitly made clear in the protocols why that deduction was given, but my guess is that the judges maybe didn't think it suited the theme of Tango Romantica because it it didn't fulfill all the other criteria for music. That's why I was quite surprised about that because it's like, um, and it kind of raises the question is like, um, does it, like, as long as the beat is there and you can make the, the, um, the key steps and sequences that you need with the music that is in fact tango does the music itself need to be tango music and that's kind of it's i don't know i i feel like it's maybe a little bit more vague uh and the isc rules and i feel like that's where that deduction came by i thought it was like you know and this is not me saying this because i like them or they're australian i thought it was actually a really creative way um around that is to like to bring in something that isn't because obviously the season we're going to have so many uh, repetitions of sort of the same or very similar music, much like last year with Rumba and I was just like dying last year. I was like <laughs> too many despositos. Yeah. Oh my god! If I have to hear it <laughs> one more time, I'm absolutely gonna. Oh, anyway. So we're gonna get that a, a lot again with Rhythm Dance this season, I suspect. But I thought that I predict that, a lot of Moulin Rouge. Yeah, I thought that music choice. That music choice was incredibly. I don't know whether it was they themselves who made it or their coach that made it, but I thought it was very, very clever um, to pick a piece of music that wasn't necessarily tango, but but alter it to fit the elements. Uh, for the rhythm dance so I I liked it so I was actually quite disappointed (laughs) that they got that deduction I think we're just gonna have to wait and see maybe in other competitions how the judges will take it because obviously if they go to multiple and they keep getting that violation you know they'll have to rework it but I overall 
I think that it worked with the choreography and the theme that they were they were trying to meet. I think that the program worked, and yeah, I'm excited to see how it will develop over the season. So Nicola was kind enough to assemble a special segment direct from the competition itself to go along with this episode, including some really interesting interviews with a few of the competing skaters there. If you're interested in listening to those, they're available right now as a bonus episode on all of our uploading platforms. This is our first competition episode of the season and we're going to be covering the Junior Grand Prix and the Grand Prix and a lot of the Challenger series. So if you have any suggestions on what you would like us to include in future competition episodes, you know, drop us a comment on Twitter, Tumblr or send us an email. We're still trying to find the best format for competition coverage. So we'd love your comments and we'd love you to tell us what you'd like to see from us. He's won the free. No, 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 that's ridiculous. So our shout out of the week for this week goes to one of the competitors at Asian Open, Kwon Hung Leung from Hong Kong, who did a very peculiar free skate in the competition which could only really be described by us as figure skating fans as kind of Cyber Swan 2.0. Of course, as we know, Cyber Swan was um, Daisuke Takahashi's short program from quite a number of years ago. And this mashup that Kwon Hung Leung did in this competition was very hip hop y, like rappy Swan Lake. And it was just, especially because he was the first guy to skate in the free. It was just like a, oh, okay. It really set the mood. And it took me, it honestly took me a hot second. I was like, he was skating for like maybe 30 seconds. I was like, wait, is this meant to be, is this, is this what this is meant to be? It was like, you know, I think it was quite um, admirable, especially because Misha Gi uh, had actually just, just rocked up to the rink uh immediately before that and was watching over the competition so i was just like oh isn't you know legends legends supporting legends trip tributes to legends it's all happening so yeah it was very fun and i think um it took a few people maybe a, a little while just to piece it together what he was actually doing but when once they did i was like oh <laughs> isn't this wonderful i also think we need to give a shout out to the announcer for his <laughs> for his thank you skater thank you skater <laughs> Thank you, Skater. That's gonna be that's drilled into my mind. I'm gonna be hearing that in my dreams for months now. <laughs> I want them to do the announcing for every, all, all competitions from now on. Thank you, Skater. I thought it was quite interesting how at the first the first senior event introducing the judges, he I don't think he knew what ISR standard for uh, stood for. Uh, Israel, obviously, but um, the first couple times he introduced that judge, he said from the ISR. And I was just like, oh, no. <laughs> but he learned. Someone must have told him at some point because he did figure it out afterwards. So bless, bless his heart. We hope to see you again. Thank you, Skater. Thank you, Skater. Thank you, announcer. Some exciting news before we wrap up the episode. We've opened up a donations portal for those who want to support In The Loop. If you'd like to help us out, please visit our Ko-fi page at ko-fi.com slash in the low podcast. That's K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash in the low podcast. Thank you for today. We hope to see you again for our bonus episode next week about figure skating and fiction and for episode eight in two weeks about the medical side of figure skating with injuries and injury prevention. If you want to get in touch with us, then please feel free to contact us via Twitter at in the low podcast or on Tumblr at in the low podcast.tumblr.com. We're on YouTube as well. Just go to youtube.com slash in the loop podcast FS and you'll find our episodes there as well. If you're listening on iTunes, please consider leaving a rating and a review if you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening. This has been Nicola, Evie, and me. See you soon. Bye 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 bye.